Hi, and welcome to our endocrine system discussion, the first lecture of second semester of anatomy and physiology, anatomy 202. And uh, today we're going to start off with some content that you will not be responsible for on the exam, this uh, history portion of the content. And uh, that's why it's noted as freebie. But it gives us an important background that will start to lead us up to defining hormones, looking at characteristics, feedback relationships as we relate to homeostasis, receptors that receive those hormones. What's the difference between the way water-soluble and lipid-soluble hormones function, the mechanism of, their, of the action of hormones, endocrine rhythms, when are they released, how, do they, how long do they stay in the system, um, along those lines, pulsatile hormone release, the, uh, the idea that we have bursts of the release of hormones at certain times or as needed. The hypothalamus and the pituitary relationship will uh, begin the discussion where we'll uh, start to branch off for our second lecture. And then we'll get specific into the anterior pituitary, posterior, the thyroid gland, parathyroid, adrenal cortex, adrenal medulla, and the pancreas. And we will have... Uh, also looked at some of the gonads and what they release and a number of other items in the mix that are key to the endocrine system. Thymus, uh, different tissues that, that can secrete different types of, of hormones. So really great discussion, really important. And um, as we've just finished up our nervous system discussion in 201, this is the jumping off point for another system that helps us control our bodies and do what we need to do to maintain homeostasis, the endocrine system. So a little history on the endocrine system. Around 400 BC, Hippocrates uh, coined the concept of humoralism, saying that there were four humors in the body fluids of the body. And these humors would convey themselves as people were injured or they would have a surgery um, if there was something that that uh, released these colored fluids from the body then they were referred to as humors or if we think about humors in um, act or in, in theater or if someone's in good humor the way that they feel starting to think, you know, these fluids that are in the body, they're different from one another, and they could influence the way that we feel, the way that we live. The thought, too, was that these humors change with the seasons, the times of day. Over a human's lifespan, the humors would change. And this was a framework to explain personality and susceptibility to disease. Starting to think about how do we work with the world? How does the world work with us? What is this all about? Too much or too little of any of the four humors directly influences temperament and health, and imbalances were treated with bleeding, vomiting, and purging. Get rid of the fluid, get rid of the problem, get rid of the humor, get rid of the problem, and come back to being in good humor. Each of the humors was related to an element, a season, or certain qualities in temperament. So for instance, if we think of the, the main elements of, of our planet, the air, was considered to be associated with spring, its humor was the blood, the qualities were warm and moist, and the temperament was sanguine or courageous, hopeful, sociable. Fire was associated with summer, and its humor was yellow bile, warm and dry, choleric, short-tempered, ambitious, aggressive. The earth was represented by the season of autumn and black bile, which would be cold and dry, melancholic, moody, pessimistic, unsociable. And we have to think that if a person was leaking some fluid that was black, um, they would probably be somewhat melancholic. Water was represented by the season of winter and phlegm or a green humor. It was cold and moist and phlegmatic, calm, controlled, and thoughtful. So again, just trying to frame the worlds in which these people lived in, that we live in, with their knowledge and trying to start to equate things that they 
could notice in nature related to their bodies and start to make sense of what life is about. Still around 400 BC, Aristotle described the effects of castration in men and birds. So castration being the removal of the testes of a male. And uh, this would have varying effects that were noted. One was that um, procreation would be stopped. So the ability of a, of a man to sire a child was, was ended after they were castrated. And eunuchs guarded the women's quarters of Hebrew kings and princes, for instance, in the Bible. This is noted in Esther uh, chapter 1, verse 10. The reason for this would be that men that couldn't procreate, yet had the strength of a man, would make perfect guards in this time's view for women. So, an interesting take on how to protect women in uh, ancient history. In the Middle Ages, 500 to 1500 AD, victors of battles ate their enemies' organs, the brain, heart, and gonads, thinking they contained important powers. Many hunters still nowadays will do the same thing. However, eating the brain has been discouraged because of mad, mad cow disease or a disease that's very similar to Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which is a brain-wasting disease. So um, eating organ meats is uh, something to be careful with in terms of prion passage, prions being uh, proteins that can alter other proteins and then also um, different conditions that, that arise from prion-based starting points like Creutzfeldt-Jakob, very similar to Alzheimer's. This was an antiquated version of hormone replacement. When these organs would be eaten, the effects of the, the hormones that were in them would be bestowed upon the person that was eating the organs. In the 17th and 18th centuries, castration became a popular means of preventing puberty to preserve the soprano singing voices of young male singers. The castrati had the range of a soprano, but the greater development of the male lungs give their sing gave their singing remarkable power. The last official castrato, amazingly, Alessandro Moreschi, retired from the Sistine Chapel in 1913. 1849, there were experiments that would re-implant testes into the body cavity of castrated roosters, and it was seen that this would reverse the atrophy of the coxcomb. So, without testosterone, the coxcomb would list to one side. When testosterone was replaced, then it would become erect again. Late in the 19th century, Claude Bernard saw the importance of regulated internal environment body fluids for animals in a changing and challenging environment. So realizing, hey, if we're living in these changing and different environments, but we need to stay the same, maybe there's something to these fluids that are within us that helps us stay more constant. And Claude studied the communication among cells, tissues, and organs and found that communication is essential for physiological coordination. Blood pressure, blood volume, glucose regulation, CO2, O2, and enzyme levels, which is really amazing at the late 19th century. This is, you know, 1800s where these conclusions are being arrived at without much of the technology and knowledge that we have today in the 21st century. Charles Brown Sigard injected himself with extracts of animal testicles and described the effects. So starting to think about just more experimentation around these uh, hormones and seeing what, what would occur when they were used. Some more endocrine history was around 1902 when Bayless and Starling identified and described the first hormone, or secretin. Secretin is key for taking the hydrochloric acid and the very acidic output of the stomach, mixing it with this output of the pancreas to help reduce the amount of acidity of the uh, chyme that is, is leaving the, the stomach. So the food that's leaving the stomach that's been digested in the stomach is very acidic, and secretin 
is created by the pancreas and enters that chain to help reduce the acidity. So this uh, introduced the concept of chemical regulation via hormones and regulatory physiology, which would be the idea that our physiology can regulate our bodies, our functions, it took a big step forward with this discovery. Further advances in experimental science led to the event identification of many more hormones, and the term endocrinology came into widespread use in the 1920s. You may have heard of the use of anabolic steroids, and uh, sometimes anabolic or building up these steroids for greater muscle mass are uh, referred to as juice. So there have been a number of athletes over the years who have been accused of or found guilty of using anabolic steroids. And uh, steroids are a class of endocrine that, that we will take a look at. The major organs that we'll be taking a look at while we're in this unit uh, vary in their location and their function. And uh, some of the things that we'll want to notice with them is key to their location. So here in the brain, we'll see the... Uh, pineal gland. We'll also see the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. In the trachea, right in the throat, we'll see the thyroid gland. Over the heart, in younger people, um, below the age of 20 probably, we could see more of the thymus. In a lot of the cadavers that we'll look at, we will not see the thymus. It disappears over time. Uh, however, it does seem to have some impact on the immune system while it's in play. We'll take a look at the adrenal glands, ad being above the renal, the kidneys, so these are adrenals. The pancreas with its key functions, we'll take a look at glucagon and insulin, and we saw secretin. It's a key organ in, in our endocrine system. We'll also see ovaries in as the female gonads, and then we'll see testes as the male gonads, and take a look at the different um, hormones that those release. So these are the, the key organs that we'll be taking a look at, and we'll be taking a look at the hormones that are within them, how they're secreted, and their actions to form the endocrine system. Hormones, uh, the word derived from the Greek word hormone, meaning to rouse or to set in motion. And when we think about other words that, that we'll be using in here, there are um, words that, that show up that we want to make sure that we're clear with. So hormone is a big one, uh, having a Greek root. We're also going to see endocrine, of course. So endo within and then crine, the, the last part of the word, or the suffix meaning to be separated or to distinguish. And then we'll also see that a lot of these hormones are tropic. And tropic is going to be another Greek word that will mean to, to turn or to change. So these are some key words that we'll see as we continue to work hormone, endocrine, and tropic. And just knowing that those are all, uh, they all originate from Greek. And then thinking about what they mean can help us as we move along with understanding them. We're going to see paracrine factors. And paracrine would be like what we've looked at within the relationship from neuron to neuron, for instance. Paracrine factors and autocrine factors. And paracrine is going to mean that these, these are hormones that relate to an effect only in the vicinity of the gland secreting it. So if we think about um, something like this that, that would be involving something like a neurotransmitter and hormones, that would be paracrine. The target is the cell that's in close proximity. Autocrine, if we think of auto, meaning that it relates to self, 
these would be items that we're looking at that are more um, within the realm of targeting cells of production or cell differentiation that happens within the embryo. Neuroendocrine factors are components that we're interested in where we're thinking about that relationship between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So all of these components, hormones, paracrine, autocrine, and neuroendocrine factors are key parts of our discussion, and they'll become more evident as how they play in as we continue. Endocrine is going to mean that we have some kind of an endocrine gland that is going to release a hormone into the bloodstream through a capillary that will go through the bloodstream and attach to a receptor on a target cell. Then we'll see paracrine again, where we have one cell that releases a paracrine factor that affects another cell. And autocrine, where we have a cell that releases an autocrine factor that will affect itself. And neuroendocrine, say we have a neuron that activates antidiuretic hormone in the hypo, from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, and that goes into a capillary for distribution to affect the function of the kidneys, then that would be neuroendocrine because we have nervous system influence affecting an endocrine outcome. So if you take a minute to try these next questions, if you pause the video while you work out your answer, um, I'll just let you know that, that you should pause and then if you don't, the video just continues. But if you do, it's an opportunity to ask yourself these questions and then uh, try your hand at it while we're not in class. These are iClicker questions that we use in class. So go ahead and pause now if you want. And here's your answer. For this next one, go ahead and pause now if you want. And here's your answer. So characteristics of hormones, we have different chemical classes. So how are the hormones actually made molecularly? And they're going to have a low concentration. So it doesn't take a lot of a hormone to affect a big change. Chemical classes of hormones then are proteins, which are derived from several amino acids. And these are peptide versus polypeptide or many peptides or groupings amines derived from one or two amino acids, and steroids derived from cholesterol. Icosanoids are derived from fatty acids, and we won't focus on them. We'll stay focused mostly on the chemical classes of proteins, amines, and steroids. We have different chemical classes. We have a low concentration, and so we have these hormones that go into the bloodstream and endocrine cells that secrete them. And then we have target cells with hormone receptors. So this is a key point of the discussion is that we are very much interested in hormones, but if we don't have specific receptors at the end of the stream, then we're just putting a molecule in our bloodstream and who cares? But when we have specific receptors for a particular hormone, this is when we start affecting change. And when you think about it, we're putting hormones into our entire bloodstream, and they're going to go to every cell in the body. Does every cell in the body react to a particular hormone? No. The only cells that react to that particular hormone would be the ones that have the receptor for that hormone. Uh, the concentrations in the blood are very low for these, these hormones, and it makes sense because we have very relatively small organs that are producing the hormones, so we need to have a large effect cellularly from a small production of hormone just to keep the efficiency and function of our body working as best as it can. So very small concentration. We're talking about 10 to the negative 12th to 10 to the negative 10th molar of, of concentration, which if you remember your molarity the um, this this in itself already is is a um, deconcentrated version of what you're putting into solution. So steroids then 10 to the negative ninth, 
if we have uh, like a thyroid hormone, 10 to the negative sixth or epinephrine or norepinephrine, very small quantities of these hormones. So the idea there is that it doesn't take a lot to have a pretty big impact and to keep us functioning. Another good thing about not needing a lot of these hormones is that it, the cells that produce them as we age and they degrade will still stand a good chance of being able to produce what we need to continue surviving even as we lose cells or cells get damaged. So it's great to know that we have a system that can keep functioning even when we may be aging or uh, ill or be damaged in some way. So different chemical classes, the low concentration concept, the concentration then is dependent on the rate of secretion. So how much do we secrete? That makes sense. It's just a direct correlation between the more you secrete, the more concentrated or vice versa. The rate of metabolism, which opens up this concept of half-life. So in the concept of half-life, what we realize is that the liver is going to end up receiving all of these hormones that enter the bloodstream because by its nature, it is a key blood filter for anything that's in the blood. So it's going to metabolize hormones, and so hormones have what we call a half-life. What, what is the amount of time that it takes for the concentration of that hormone to be cut in half? And then we're also interested in this um, concentration of hormones based on the binding proteins that are in the blood. So binding proteins are necessary to sort of escort these hormones through this aqueous environment to their destination. So what kind of binding proteins do we have? Some ideas on half-life. Peptides, 2 to 30 minutes is, is how long they, they will have. Uh, they'll be, concentration will be cut in half. Proteins, an hour. Steroids, 30 minutes to 2 hours. Catecholamines, 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, if we have our T3 and T4 released from the thyroid, one day to seven days, uh, so these can hang out for a while. Binding proteins then, if we think about these proteins that when the hormone goes into the bloodstream, it has to be bound to another protein so that it can make it to its destination. And here then, if we think about globulins, these are very large molecules that increase solubility of a hormone, or they'll also uh, extend the half-life just by the nature of their connection, they resist the metabolism in the liver. Catecholamines are mostly water-soluble, these binding proteins. They use albumin, and uh, their binding is nonspecific, and they have a low affinity. Protein hormones that are water-soluble are also going to use al albumin, and their binding is nonspecific with a low affinity. So these the low affinity concept is is we're thinking about these are um, pretty open to capturing hormones and they themselves these binding proteins are water soluble so they they'll help bridge the gap between hormones that may not be water soluble and help them move through the bloodstream in, in a solute manner so that they can arrive at their destination and do what they need to do. And finally, for uh, steroids and thyroid hormones, they're lipid soluble and they use their own binding proteins and binding is specific with a high affinity. So these uh, are a couple of different thoughts on binding proteins and how they work in the body. And again, binding proteins are going to increase solubility or extend half-life. Just remembering that and how they will associate, like in this figure, if the red triangles are a steroid hormone, the green triangles are a protein hormone, and then we have a, a BP, a binding protein, and then we also have albumin that is working within this. So depending on what the hormone is, it's going to have a specific binding protein to help it move through the, the aqueous blood. Some characteristics of hormones continued then. Regulation of hormone secretion. 
we come back to a concept from, uh, from our Bio 201 class, negative feedback and positive feedback. So remembering that negative feedback is going to negate the original stimulus. So whatever the original stimulus was, the, our, our bodies will try to reverse that and bring us back to homeostasis. Positive feedback is more rare than negative feedback, but it will, by its nature, it will enhance the original stimulus, and then usually it is followed by a negative feedback cycle to reset the system. So examples we've seen with positive feedback would be the um, release of oxytocin for contractions in the uterus, and then also uh, the blood clotting factor when we uh, seal a cut or a wound with clotting factor, that both of those instances would be our major positive feedback examples. But in each case, those will be followed by a negative feedback loop that resets that system. So in this system then, we remember that we have a control center that's usually the hypothalamus, but it may be something else. We'll see another organ or location. We have an effector to affect change and the variable that we're trying to affect change with. So here, uh, negative feedback, we have, say, an increase in variable x. The control center senses that. So for instance, if this goes to the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is always monitoring the, um, the blood to determine do we have appropriate amount of calcium, do we have appropriate amounts of you know, any number of items that we want to control. If no, or if yes, um, then, then we're going to have different results. So that's going to say then in this instance that we have an effector that increases and then we have a variable that decreases. So to uh, take a look at another one, glucose, we have a glucose increase and we have beta cells of the pancreas and so then we have a um, increase in insulin that will then allow most cells to have more glucose uptake. And so then in the bloodstream, what we see happen is that we have a decrease in glucose. So let's go ahead and watch a video on this and just take a look at uh, a really good video that comes with the book and see what you think about this. The sugary snack you devour enters your digestive system and is broken down to simple sugars like glucose. Glucose enters the bloodstream, causing an increase in blood glucose levels. But various mechanisms bring blood glucose back down to its normal level, the set point. This is an example of homeostasis, the body's tendency to maintain relatively constant internal conditions. Hormones produced by the pancreas regulate blood glucose levels. Let's zoom in. When blood glucose levels are high, glucose molecules leave the blood and enter beta cells in the pancreas. The beta cells respond by releasing the hormone insulin. Insulin enters the bloodstream and is transported to cells all over the body. Let's see what happens in the liver. Insulin binds to receptors on liver cells. This causes the cells to take in more glucose. Inside the liver cells, glucose is converted to glycogen, a storage molecule. Blood glucose levels decrease as glucose is taken up by liver cells and other body cells. As a result, less and less insulin is released by the pancreas, and blood glucose levels stabilize at their set point. This is an example of how negative feedback maintains homeostasis. What happens if you've skipped lunch and your blood glucose levels are low? Let's zoom into the pancreas again. When blood glucose levels are low, alpha cells in the pancreas release the hormone glucagon, 
glucagon enters the bloodstream and acts on target cells in the liver. Glucagon binds to receptors on the liver cells, signaling the liver cells to break glycogen down to glucose. Glucose is released. and blood glucose levels increase. As a result, less glucagon is released by the pancreas, and blood glucose levels stabilize at their set point. In this way, two hormones with opposing effects allow the body to maintain homeostasis of blood glucose levels. In diabetes, the body is unable to maintain homeostasis of blood glucose levels. In type 1 diabetes, the beta cells of the pancreas are destroyed by the immune system, and so no insulin is produced. In type 2 diabetes, the pancreas produces insulin, but target cells do not take up glucose. In both types of diabetes, when blood glucose levels rise, cells do not take up the additional glucose, and so blood glucose remains high. This example shows the importance of homeostasis in everyone's life. So again, uh, as that video showed, if we have increased glucose in our bloodstream, then we'll have uh, beta cells of the pancreas that go ahead and release insulin and then we'll have glucose uptake in uh, the liver and also in most cells and then that in turn will reduce the glucose in our bloodstream so kind of a, a nice video that shows this and some more items uh, specific to diabetes and the function of pan the uh, the pancreas with the release of both glucagon for um, the release of sugars from the liver and then the release of insulin for the, the, the collection of glucose into cells of the body and the liver. When we get a little more specific about negative feedback, we have this idea of a long loop versus a short loop, and uh, this plays into primary versus secondary endocrine disorders. So here, for instance, if we have a thyroid gland that has released, um, uh, or it's... Uh, showing decreased amounts of T3 and T4 in its release, what we realize then is that um, the, the way to change this is to have more of this um, thyroid releasing hormone that will influence the pituitary gland to release thyroid stimulating hormone that then will increase the T3 and T4 levels of the uh, hormone release from the thyroid gland. So along these lines then, when we take a look at what is the, what is the long loop, what is the short loop, the, the idea with this then would be that here we're, we're thinking about when, when these increased levels of, of T3 and T4, when these go up, there is a sense in the bloodstream that tells the hypothalamus we're good on T3 and T4. You can quit releasing the uh, thyroid releasing hormone. This is a long loop. So this is the loop that says you're all the way out here at the end. Hey, hypothalamus, we're good to go. Um, the other area that can advise the hypothalamus is it's checking contents of, of the bloodstream is when the anterior pituitary releases its thyroid stimulating hormone, the release of this can actually be sensed by the hypothalamus, and then the hypothalamus can quit releasing the thyroid releasing hormone, which then quits asking the anterior pituitary gland to release its stimulating hormone and will quit increasing T3 and T4. This over here is the, the short loop. So when we think about negative feedback, we're negating the original stimulus of a lower amount of T3 and T4 
And uh, so we negated that. We increased it. How do we know then that we can stop increasing it? We have to have that feedback to the hypothalamus of either T3 and T4 in the bloodstream or of the thyroid stimulating hormone. So just saying that, you know, however far downstream we get, there's uh, a long response to that or there's a short response to that that will stop that um, production so that we're in homeostasis. So that's kind of the, the long loop, short loop portion of the discussion. And it makes sense in this cascade of events, we can have it readjust and it's always sensing its own function as well. A positive feedback loop then, in this one we're thinking about the original stimulus is enhanced. So again, we still have a control center, an effector, and a variable. So let's say that our variable increases and the control center senses that and the effector then increases its release and then that enhances the release of the original variable. So um, an example of this would be contractions that say the fetal head is pushing against the cervix which then is sensed, those, those stretch receptors are sensed by the hypothalamus that then releases oxytocin from its posterior compartment into the pituitary gland to then be released into the bloodstream. And then that in inspires more uterine contraction until the baby is birthed. And then this system would reset to where contractions end after the birthing of the child. A concept here then uh, coming up is the degree of action on the target cell. And this is going to depend on circulating levels of the hormone, so how much do we have, the numbers of receptors for the hormone, and then the affinity of the hormone for its receptor. So affinity also means desire or um, some kind of a, a connectivity. So affinity would be to, to just say um, how much does the, the hormone have an interest in interacting with the receptor that it's going to. So receptors themselves are again uh, on the surface of the cell membrane, this phospholipid cell membrane, so a, a sandwich layer of phospholipids, and so receptors are proteins within that membrane. They generally bind hormone with high affinity, so it just makes sense that a key that fits a lock is going to open that lock better than a key that doesn't. And um, just saying that high affinity means a high desire. So those hormones are going to be bound that match their receptors more readily. Um, concentrate hormone to target cell. So, so how much of this hormone can we get to the target cell? That makes a difference in, in uh, how it's received. And then this will initiate a biological response that will trigger responses at variable speeds. So time to onset of action, if we think of the type of hormone and then the time to response, catecholamines are milliseconds, so very fast. Peptides are seconds to minutes. Proteins are minutes to hours. And steroids are hours to days. So if we think about steroid medications, for instance, like say say steroid medications that we would use for treatment of asthma, you'll see a lot of the indications for these medications that it's recommended that they be taken uh, a few days before it's expected to see any results from them. And that's because um, we have a, a certain amount of time that it takes before they affect change at that DNA level and alter the cells. So, um, the regulation of receptors then, what, what we would think initially is, oh, okay, so receptors would just be static. They just are what they are, and they're always in a set quantity on the cell. However, that's not the case. So hormones themselves can regulate the sensitivity of target cells by changing the receptor number in target cells. So the idea here then would be that uh, we have this phospholipid bilayer and it is if we if we think about a, 
a classic self, say from Bio 111. We have our cell membrane. We have a nucleus. And if we were to zoom into a part of this membrane, we would see that in this membrane, we have these uh, sort of a two layer row of phospholipids. And they have these polar heads and then these nonpolar tails. So the polar heads are hydrophilic. We have water outside of the cell and polar tails are hydrophobic. They're afraid of water. And so this is the model that, that is really key to our discussion because if a water soluble molecule approaches this, it won't be able to get in. It won't be able to pass through these two layers and then into the cell. So there has to be a protein out here that will create a change when it's approached by a water-soluble hormone. And so when that water-soluble hormone reaches this protein, we're going to see a change that happens inside the cell. So this idea then is that these, these receptors are proteins that are inside the phospholipid bilayer, and they're going to be available to go ahead and receive these water-soluble hormones. They themselves can be regulated or adjusted by changing the number in target cells. The affinities of receptors for ho hormones can change. And this in itself can regulate the sensitivity of a target cell. So here, an example of one of these receptors. So this is a growth hormone receptor that receives growth hormone. And we have these ideas of downregulation and upregulation. Downregulation would decrease the receptor number, which would decrease activity. Upregulation would increase the receptor number or increase activity. So prolonged exposure to a hormone can downregulate receptors for a hormone. So our bodies are really keen on saying, okay, if you have a lot of this hormone, then uh, we don't need as many receptors. We could use those proteins in other parts of the body. So there's an efficiency idea here that comes into play. A hormone can change the number of receptors for another hormone. So an example of this would be in the uterus. Progesterone can downregulate estrogen receptors. And estrogen, on the other hand, can upregulate progesterone receptors. And we have this relationship between progesterone and estrogen that is key in the way that, say, for instance, a menstruation cycle works. And uh, we always have this interplay between these two hormones. We'll fall out of homeostasis if we lose one or the other of those hormones or the cells that produce them, say, within the ovaries, uh, as, we, as women age, and uh, these, these hormones are reduced, then we see different effects that affect homeostasis, where we may need um, pharmaceutical or some kind of supplementation or different thoughts on how to approach uh, a loss of estrogen. Functional changes caused by hormones. These are the, the four major items that, that if we were to just classify and, and discuss what do hormones do for us, why, are they, why do they matter, we would say reproduction, growth and development, the maintenance of body fluids, and metabolism. So major functional changes that hormones cause that allow us to live the lives that we do. This idea again of, of water-soluble versus lipid-soluble hormones, coming back to that idea of the plasma membrane. So here, a plasma membrane with a nucleus with DNA inside. We would have water-soluble hormones that would approach the plasma membrane, and they would interact with one of these um, integrated proteins that's in the cell membrane of the cell, 
and that NAT would inspire action outside of that. Lipid-soluble hormones, then, are able to go through the phospholipid bilayer and even into the nucleus if they have a proper receptor inside the cell. And so we have a contrast that our receptors for water-soluble hormones are on the plasma membrane. Our receptor for lipid-soluble hormones are actually inside the cell. And the effect that those lipid-soluble hormones have when they're shuttled into the nucleus is to go ahead and affect changes with DNA and impact change within the cell from that perspective. The water-soluble hormones mechanism of action is what we refer to as a second messenger pathway through cyclic AMP, sort of a uh, game of telephone that occurs when we have a hormone bind to an integrated receptor that hands off to a G protein. And then through this uh, activation of the protein, it moves down and activates uh, the adenylate cyclase, which then goes ahead and converts ATP to cyclic AMP. So we have a molecular change there. And this goes on to activate protein kinases. And, when, and whenever we see A's, we think of an enzyme, which is a protein that will affect change in the body. So let's take a minute and watch a video on this happening, which I think will help you with some of this idea of second messenger pathway that's exclusive to water-soluble hormones, and uh, see what you think. The endocrine system consists of hormone-producing tissues located throughout the body. The circulating hormones control the rates of body processes and maintain homeostasis. Within an endocrine gland, endocrine cells secrete hormones, which diffuse into nearby capillaries. The cardiovascular system transports these hormones throughout the body, affecting target cells in various tissues. Target cells for a specific hormone have receptors that bind the unique three-dimensional shape of that hormone. Cells that lack a specific hormone receptor are unresponsive to that hormone, even if a high concentration of the hormone is present around the cells. Although cells express a variety of receptors, we'll focus on one particular class, receptors that bind water-soluble hormones and exert their effects through the intracellular second messenger cyclic AMP. These receptors are embedded in the cell's plasma membrane, because water-soluble hormones cannot enter the target cell directly. A hormone molecule, acting as the first messenger, binds to its receptor, causing the receptor to change shape. The receptor can now activate specific intracellular G proteins. The activation process begins with the release of a GDP molecule from the G protein in exchange for a GTP molecule. This causes the G protein to change shape and become active. The hormone-bound receptor activates many individual G proteins, which greatly amplifies the signal from a single hormone molecule. An activated G protein diffuses along the plasma membrane until it binds to and activates the enzyme adenylate cyclase. Once active, Adenylate cyclase converts ATP to the second messenger, cyclic AMP. These many molecules of cyclic AMP from each activated cyclase enzyme represent a further amplification of the initial hormone signal. The increased concentration of cyclic AMP activates enzymes known as protein kinases. These activated protein kinases phosphorylate a variety of proteins within the cell. This changes the activity of those proteins and generates the cell's hormone response. The cell's response is characterized by the specific proteins present in the cytoplasm, only some of which can be phosphorylated by protein kinase. The cellular response diminishes rapidly once the hormone is no longer bound to its receptor.
G proteins hydrolyze their bound GTP to GDP, returning to their inactive state, and dissociate from adenylate cyclase. This ends cyclic AMP production. Existing cyclic AMP is degraded by the enzyme phosphodiesterase, which is already present in the cytoplasm. As the cyclic AMP concentration returns to resting levels, protein kinase inactivates, preventing further protein phosphorylation. The target cell has now returned to its pre-stimulus condition, ready to respond to future hormone signals. The signal of a water-soluble hormone binding to a receptor on the plasma membrane is amplified through the activation of many G proteins and the generation of even more cyclic AMP. This cyclic AMP activates many protein kinases, which affect many thousands of intracellular proteins, all shaping the target cell's response. The response of many target cells produces the homeostatic and regulatory effects controlled by the endocrine system. I think that video shows a really nice way of thinking about how the second messenger pathway in relation to water-soluble hormones works. In contrast, then, our lipid-soluble hormones are able to pass through the plasma membrane and into the cell where their receptors are actually inside the cell. Once they've merged with a receptor, then they can pass through into the nucleus and affect change with DNA to create new proteins from messenger RNA that's created. So here, uh, if you want to take a minute and try this question, and then I'll go ahead and advance. So if you'd like to, please pause right now, pause your video, and try this question. And here's your answer for that question. So we want to arrive at this hydrophobic or hydrophilic question of what molecule we're dealing with first. Here's another question for you to try. I'll pause if you want to pause the video now. And the answer for that question. The difference in the steroid hormones being that that uh, receptor is inside the target cell rather than on the cell membrane. And if you'd like to try this question and then pause the video before the answer shows up. And there's the answer for that question. And then if you'd like to try this question, please pause the video. And here's your answer for that question. And this idea of amplification that occurs, you could see that in the video when we've entered the, the cell and the cyclic AMP is in play. The way that that cascade occurs until that hormone is removed can create trillions of changes when we amplify that to the number of cells that are affected just with one or a, you know, a small amount of hormone in the bloodstream. This is the heart of the amplification concept within hormone release and function. So now we turn a corner to endocrine rhythms. And if we think about this, the idea behind endocrine rhythms is that um, endocrines are released rhythmically within our body. So many rhythms are circadian, which would be in approximately 24 hour periods. Uh, some are diurnal, which would, could be circadian or dependent on the ratio of lightness to darkness. And within this, then, some even follow a lunar cycle. So it's kind of interesting that as we were looking at the history of the endocrine system, that the concept of the humors was tied in to a certain extent with thoughts about daily or monthly or lifetime changes in the body that would affect the way that the body functioned. And as we find out through research, this is accurate in terms of the way that the endocrine hormones are released. Uh, within a, a cyclic secretion of growth hormone, 
cyclic meaning that we're starting here at 8 a.m. and then we're we're ending at 8 a.m. so we're in a 24-hour cycle moving through a military clock uh, style down at the bottom. You can see these peaks of release in microgram per liter of growth hormone how this is is releasing in a pulsatile fashion fashion so there are bursts of growth hormone released and we hit this peak of growth hormone around two in the morning say you know and, and there would certainly be variance in this but in general this is a, a concept of cyclic secretion that would happen in a pulsatile fashion so a pulse of release here then is is just sort of a chart thinking of growth hormone off time is about two hours and then you know on either side of that two hours we're, we're generally going to have a pulse release of growth hormone within our systems the uh, location of what we're interested in for many of these hormones we've been talking about is the pituitary gland so the pituitary gland is tied on to the infundibulum which is uh, beneath or inferior to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus is this triangle that is below or hypo to the thalamus which is this mass right here and we can see the interthalamic adhesion right here so interthalamic adhesion the thalamus and then the hypothalamus in this triangle of uh, flesh here and then the infundibulum connecting to the pituitary gland a close-up of that just showing this pituitary gland sitting down in the hypophysial fossa of cella turcica so that relationship between the hypothalamus the pituitary gland tied on with the stalk of the infundibulum and the hypothalamus has a lot of these centers that are collections of neurons that are producing certain hormones that will be distributed out of the pituitary gland and so the, the um, hypothalamus is creating these releasing hormones that will inspire release of stimulating hormones from the pituitary gland in the anterior portion of the pituitary gland. And in the posterior portion of the pituitary gland, we'll actually see the creation of oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone in the hypothalamus. And then those hormones are transmitted to the posterior portion of the pituitary gland to be released into the bloodstream. So a dissection of this, remember in the hypothalamus that we, all, we have this area that's also around the, the third ventricle or around the thalamus that is the third ventricle. The stalk or the, uh, this, this connection with the infundibulum that ties into the anterior and posterior pituitary gland. So here we're looking at an anterior view where we see the anterior pituitary gland anteriorly and the posterior hiding out behind it. Just a, a dissection of those glands showing the, the difference in size in between the, the anterior and the posterior. And you can really see that size difference in anterior here, posterior here, and noting this coloration, the darker coloring in the anterior as compared to the posterior, so that when we look at a slide, you would see that this lighter portion would most likely be the posterior and the darker would be the anterior. 